Um, so I was discussing this earlier about being a weather geek because um, that is what I am, and that's why I set up Good Energy 20 years ago. I, I got to study atmospheric physics, which at the time was the easier option than doing nuclear. Um, and from my point of view, um, you could see it even then, the kind of writing on the wall um, or the writing in the sky, in terms of what is likely to happen in terms of climate change. And, and, and my passion has been governments tend to move quite slowly. Political processes um, tend to be swayed by incumbents. So actually, one of the key ways to address this is to go to directly to consumers, and as the last speaker, was, as Jan was talking about, and start to talk to them, because sometimes consumers are actually far more innovative and far more forward-thinking than governments can sometimes be. Um, and I don't think I can really start today without chatting. And, and it, it was quite interesting in the plenary session this morning. I don't know when anybody saw the butterfly pictures is it, that Beth put up. So those are monarch butterflies. I'm sure some people recognize them. Um, they, they're, they're, they have dwindled significantly, so nearly a billion less monarch butterflies on the planet because of climate change. And these are direct impacts we're seeing today. And, this, and the, the announcement yesterday was basically saying that every, every half degree counts. That means every time we change the temperature of this planet, it will make a significant impact on the species and on the, our sustainability as, as a society. So I, that, that's kind of where I started from, good energy. But I can see by all your faces, if I'd gone and tried and sell you that, it wouldn't have worked. And actually, what you actually need to talk about is the possible future solutions, the ideas of where people can go and where people can take positive action on either an individual or a corporate level to be part of the solution that we talk about. So uh, now, that's... So, I'm going to talk about the grand challenges. Now, this was touched on by the minister this morning. The UK has put a significant amount of money um, behind R&D in the UK. And they've called, they've come up with sort of four key grand challenges. Um, and these are three of them. So the first one is clean growth. The second one is AI and data. And the third one is future of mobility. And if you kind of think about what might be happening in these tech, in, with new tech and new R&D, and you start to think about how these three might come together, you start to look at a different way at the energy market that we haven't seen for the last 20 years. Um, and in terms of that, so if I look at renewables, we are in what I call a renewable age today. If you look at a really dull graph, which I didn't put up here today, but if you look at a really dull graph and you look at all the power plants that have been installed in the UK over the last 50 years, what you see is that coal is in there, then nuclear is in there, then gas is in there, and the last decade has really been pretty much all renewables. And that's the theme that you begin to see worldwide. So if you look at some of the countries, we've got Costa Rica, Albania, Uruguay, over 90% of their energy is produced from renewable energy. So when people say 100% renew renewable electricity or energy isn't possible, there are countries already out there proving they are. There's, there's other countries with 100% or close to 100% commitments. You've got Sweden, we've got Iceland, obviously. They've got some pretty good kick-ass natural capability up there. And Norway, again, quite a lot of sort of natural capability. But these countries are already showing the way that we can do this. And we mustn't forget that. But what's really exciting is when you begin to look at countries like Kenya, so Kenya is looking at building a wind farm that will produce 20% of their electricity. That is a significant shift. The technology has changed, the price of the technology, our capability of integrating it into grids and supplying it to consumers has completely transformed over the last 20 years. Morocco is looking at putting in solar that would supply a million households. And you've got China, one of the biggest investors worldwide in renewable technologies. So these are significantly shifted. And the UK has made a pretty transformatory capability over the last 20 years. So when I first started off in this industry, I went to uh, see a, a piece by a guy called Jeremy Leggett, who's a bit of a solar king. Um, and if you ever follow him, he's quite, he's quite funny. He's quite out there. And I went to see him speak. And I went to see him speak above a pub in West London. And you could fit the whole of the renewables industry into this pub. And they were all there. And um, today, that's... Uh, you, you see the UK is now producing 30% of its electricity from renewable energy. And that is in a 20-year period. Think about how, many time, how long it takes to build a nuclear power plant in that same period. The dramatic change in this technology has been huge. But what's really interesting, it's been very technology-led. 
hasn't really been led from a consumer point of view at all. So when you, when you go and talk to wind power developers, they think about the contracts they can get. They think about the... Um, they think about the money they can get. They very rarely had a conversation about the power they actually supply to people. And that conversation has kind of really been disjuncted. And I think now is a really exciting time to see that change. The other thing is, I'm sure most people have seen this. So as most people have seen, I hope this is going to work, this is the Google Assist. Yes? Hands up who's seen the Google Assist thing online. OK, so I gave this presentation to a bunch of energy energy experts, R&D experts, loads of scientists who are lovely. Um, I think one of them has seen this. OK, so they're in their world, which is brilliant, absolutely fantastic. But I'm just going to play this to you. But I want to I give you a prompt before I play it to you. Think about if you had this in an energy company's call centre. Think about what an AI call centre could do. So one of the biggest issues we have is, one, we can't always talk in the language that people want to talk in. So um, we have to translate, and then we're going to have to go and find those language speakers. So that's a possibility. Think about the fact that if somebody gets an energy bill that's higher than they think it is, most people, if they've got a call centre, they'll be trying to finish that call within five to seven minutes. They don't want to then stay on the call particularly and go, your energy bill looks really high this month. What's been going on in your house? Can I give you a hand? Is there anything you should be talking about? So I, I think this technology is, as we go down this journey, thinking imaginatively about how we might disrupt the way we interact with consumers. Because so far, we're driven by price. Every conversation a regulator has is about price. It's not about quality of service. It's about price. And actually, if, you, if that's all you deliver to your consumers, you don't actually help them go on a journey in terms of how they use their energy. What's happening, Althea? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm hmm. <laughs> so, the reason I stopped there is the mm hmm is the human part. And the point about humans is that we like talking to other humans or we like somebody caring about us on the other end of the phone. And I don't think this technology will replace humans on the other end of the phone, but think what it could assist with. Think how it could change the conversation you have with an energy consumer who's never thought about the fact that their energy company might actually have a conversation with them about energy. The next area is electric vehicles. This is a massive area. This is going to be changing hugely. Um, I grew up, my, my dad was a rally and co-driver, and I grew up around, a, I call myself a high-carbon baby. I spent a lot of time in very fast rally cars as a kid. And what was fascinating about that technology is it was sold on being extremely exciting, extremely, it all got sold on the car and the engine and the experience and the open road. So today, the open road doesn't really exist. I don't know how many people drove here today or went in a traffic jam or came in from the airport, probably got stuck in traffic. The experience we see today is completely different. And I think, for me, this is what's really exciting about electric vehicles, is electric vehicles isn't just going to change the way we travel. It's going to change the experience of how we travel, and we touched on that earlier. But the tra transformation that we're seeing is in Norway, 45% of all new cars sold are now electric. Now, the government has got really behind that, and it's, I think you get free charging for every consumer, but that's a huge shift in terms of new cars. If you look at um, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance, are talking about a third of all the new fleet and half of new cars will be electric by 2040. And then if you look at China, 8% of cars produced in China going forwards will be electric. So you start to see these transformations coming through, and this is going to come in and collide. So if I kind of paint a picture for you, I've got a set of renewable technologies that are taking on the world and are the potentially the lowest cost technologies in terms of implementing for new renewables. You've then got AI and data, something that we just haven't had before and that consumer lens in terms of how we interact with consumers. And you've got mobility coming in, which is going to completely rely on the fact that you need an energy system to deliver it. And so... The disruption in this marketplace, in the energy market, and particularly the electricity part of the energy market, is going to be huge and very exciting, but, but huge. And, and, and where it's going to go is going to be really interesting. And this is, if you look at this, you look at generating the old world, large centralised power stations where 
if something didn't wake up on a Monday morning, they used to give Fred a call at the power station and ask them to switch on a coal power station. That's how it worked. Today, we're going to be able to say, I'm going to be able to ring up your home and say, have you got some extra solar I can borrow off you? Or can I borrow and barter? So the kind of idea of a peer-to-peer -peer approach to energy is going to significantly shift. We've got loads of challenger energy brands, which is really exciting. Um, I mean, there was a comment earlier about what you should do is take your teams out and go and see other people and be inspired by other people. Being inspired by some of the other energy firms has made me think about this. And I think that, that bringing that into this market is really important in terms. And then I think the new world is going to look very different. It won't be decentralized. It will be an empowered world where people have technologies in their own homes and it will all integrate. But if you look at that world today, this is my view of how this world looks. So you've got a bunch of technologies. So if we go and look, there's lots of technologies out there that are really exciting. Um, and I'm being, yeah, okay. Um, that are really exciting, but the consumer, the consumer can't add them all together. And what you end up with the people in here are people who are what we call eco-warriors, warriors, warriors, eco-warriors. Um, people out there who are happy to deal with stuff that is difficult. But in the future, if you want to change that to go forwards, you're going to have to make it easier for everybody to adopt this technology. I use this example. Um, there is a brilliant book. There's a brilliant book. I'll tell you which book it is in a minute, um, which talks about the potato peeler. So this, there was a designer in New York who decided that she was going to design products. And she decided that she was going to dress herself up as an old woman. So what she did is she put lots of splints on her fingers. She put, she, she put a grey wig on, she put a basket on, she made herself stoop, and she experienced New York as an older person. And what she found was the doors were really difficult to open, that people kind of brushed past her. Um, but one of the things that she, she designed was this, was this um, potato peeler. Because if you think, if you've got hands that don't work very well, grabbing hold of, if anybody ever has peeled potatoes, um, that little metal thing really hurts your hands. So she did what I call is design with empathy. This is a book by a guy called Roman. If you get a chance to read it, it's fantastic. He's also a friend of mine, so that helps. A friend because I read his book, actually. Um, but this whole concept is we have to put ourselves in people's shoes when they're dealing with technology, whether it's a potato peeler or an energy app. Otherwise, they're not going to use it. And so our view is the future home has to be empathetic in its energy design. You have to look at it from a consumer point of view. If you start from tech first, we're going to miss out. We're going to miss out on actually a much wider market. And that's not just for the domestic consumer. I think it goes for businesses as well. There are some businesses who are really savvy in terms of how they're buying their energy. They're already commissioning solar parks. They're already out there. But there's a lot of smaller companies who actually this just isn't on their, on their radar. So we're going to have to make it easier if we're going to get massive exception of renewables and energy saving technologies um, and electric vehicles. So my view is that the eco warriors, warriors have t taken the lead. And in fact, for the carbon, the carbon storage technology that we were talking about earlier, that Yam was talking about, these are the kind of people you need to start off with. These are people who will do something even if it's more expensive and it's difficult. But what's really interesting is that the eco-warriors are the much larger market. These are the people who want you to make it easy. And they will recycle, and they will take the bike, and they will try and lower their carbon foot, but, you, but they will only do it if you can help them. So I think when you get renewable tech making digital tech, and you can make these things simple and integrate from a consumer point of view, <laughs> suddenly you get this amazing transformation that can really move fast, and much faster than we've ever thought. And what was, what was really exciting in, this, in the tech world, in the renewable tech world, is solar. Solar transformed the energy market. All the big energy suppliers didn't think it would happen, which is, if you ever look at any of the big six energy suppliers, they never invested in solar because they didn't believe in it. And I think this is where we are today, is this is a hugely disruptive capability in here with digital making renewable tech and then taking over. Um, I, I've got a video, but is that too long? It's very quick.
Thank you for listening.